Hi, Peter. It's really great to have you on the show. And, um, you know, I think we're going to have a, an interesting conversation on this topic that I think not a lot of people uh, often get to hear the perspective you're about to offer. And uh, we'll get into it shortly. But before we do, I'd love to hear a little bit about you and what you do. But, you know, you've been um, you've been disabled since you were 18 years old, and it's mm. all started with chronic uh, pancre pancreatitis. I can't speak apparently. Close enough. Yeah, close pancreatitis. Close. Yeah, <laughs> pancreatitis. And um, you know, I clearly have a speech impairment. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah. Um, but can you, you know, and you're also a journalist. Has been writing about health and the opioids uh, issues and and all sorts of things. So I'd love to uh, just get a little bit of background, maybe first on sort of your, um, uh, you know, disability, how that sort of developed, and um, how that also developed your interest in how to get effective treatment for pain uh, treatment. Sure, definitely. Yeah. So like you said, um, by the way, thanks for having me on the show. Um, yeah, my really? name is Pischke. I'm a health and disability reporter. I cover some other stuff, but that's what I went to school for. And it's actually what I've ended up doing, which is kind of nice. Um, I've been disabled now almost 15 years. Uh, it started with uh, chronic pancreatitis at age 18. Uh, it's idiopathic, which means they don't really know what's causing it. Um, it's a very difficult, painful illness that destroys a lot of your function. Basically, it's your pancreas digesting itself for a lack of a, a more nuanced explanation. Um, and, you know, until around 2018, from when I was 18 till then, I had been using um, opioid therapy for, you know, my long term pain. And in 2018, I was with my physician, a prestigious uh, doctor, well-respected. Still, I still quite respect her, but she's in my local community here. And she just caught up, cut me off cold turkey. And she set me aside one day. And she says, look, I just don't want to be prescribing to opioids to anyone anymore. It's just you and this one gal with MS. And I'm going to try to get both of you off. And she was very frank about it. And it was a shock to me because I had always obeyed all the rules. You know, I never called in early. I took my medicine as prescribed. I, I'm a uh, member of the Church of Christ Latter-day Saints, which is kind of interesting if you cover the drug scene. Um, so I've never done drugs. And since I have the pancreatitis, I guess I never will. Um, but none of that seemed to matter with her. Um, until that point, I actually had been working as a school teacher. And after I had my medicine taken away, my function to just dive bomb. It just fell uh, out of the clouds and hit the earth. And so um, I started becoming more interested in the topic and connecting more with the chronic pain community. And I was like, okay, so how widespread is this? What's going on? And that led to me getting back into uh, reporting and journalism. I've now been for four years covering the topic of the opioid crisis, both from the side that most are familiar with, the addiction and uh, overdose side, but also the opioid prohibition, which is the backlash to that which has caused uh, a lot of damage, mostly untold, to millions of Americans in a very significant and negative way. And it's a tough conversation to have. This is, your podcast is perfect about forbidden conversations because this is a conversation that if you have the experience, you have a loved one, they need pain medicine. Like, you know, maybe they're a cancer patient, they're an end of life, they're in a situation where they need pain medicine, and they don't receive that. Everyone agrees, hey, why can't grandma have her morphine or her oxy? But until they get to that experience, most people don't have much of an opinion on this topic, which, which is a, a major issue, because this is a very important thing, a major pillar of medicine that makes modern medicine possible. Just as important as anesthesia or antibiotics is pain control. And unfortunately, due to the era we are in, due to the efforts of the U.S. government and others to try to solve this issue by uh, going after patients and physicians, we are taking this amazing modern miracle and we're throwing it out, you know, the proverbial baby with the bathwater situation. So when your doctor cut you off this medication, uh, did she say why she was doing that? And did she provide an alternative plan for how that treatment was going to go? Because obviously you're, you've got the pain to deal with. 
Um, ye, ye, okay, so I'll do the second part first. So she did give me alternatives. Uh, commonly, this happens a lot. So she tried to put me on muscle relaxers. That wasn't very effective. She put me on gabapentin and antidepressants. Um, we now know all the science that says the antidepressants and gabapentin, um, which is actually a neuro and addiction drug. They don't do anything for pain, but there was some studies that were popular at the time that we now know are fake that this could, you know, potentially help. But basically she kind of left me cold turkey because it was like, I'm not going to fill another one. You know, it's kind of like, a little bit of it sucks to be you and just kind of let me hang. Now she's a good doctor. I mean, she's, she works at a free clinic here in town. She's very well respected, but uh, she was for the most part, pretty frank. This is actually many times when people are cut off the, their physicians gaslight them and say, this is about you. You have a problem. She didn't do that to me in this particular case, which is a, a little different. Right. So, you know, one thing that I found sort of interesting about your background is that you have a master's in health reporting, um, which I think is pretty rare. I think a lot of journalists who cover uh, health issues and these kinds of topics, they don't tend to necessarily have um, a background in health, you know, in science. Some of them do, but a lot of them don't, and let alone have their own experiences with disabilities. So I'm wondering, to what extent do you think that affects the coverage that we see in the reporting? Uh, because a lot of the ways that we get to know about these issues is obviously through these reportings, unless we have like, you know, personal experiences or experiences of our loved ones, we kind of hear about it secondhand. Now, that is an excellent observation on your part. So uh, you get a cookie. Um, Yay. This, like this is something cookies. I don't think many people are aware of. The, it's a huge problem in the world of reporting where you have people who are generalists and have very little insight or context into a particular issue, and then they just try to cover it. And I'm not saying you shouldn't. I mean, you know, if you're any kind of reporter, you're going to be at one point or another covering something you don't really know all that well. That's fine. But it does have a huge impact because people are not familiar with these terms that they can be easily misled by press releases, by statements from the DEA, or the CC, or the FDA. They just put out something and say, this is how it is. They do not have that medical or scientific backing to understand why that may not be true. And it is a major issue. There used to actually be more people like me. I'm kind of a weird case, um, but it used to be, this was really true in the days between like the 60s and the end of the 80s. There were a lot of journalists who covered health that actually had medical professional backgrounds. Um, the New York Times especially, they were known for this, having excellent health coverage back then. And they would hire people who are previously doctors to cover these topics. Um, and they are important topics. They're hard to break into. The medical community is wonderful, but it's not an easy one to understand. And uh, it's it's always important to be able to talk to someone that can understand what is going on. Because, you know, you you need that ability to decipher what the hieroglyphs say. And without it, you know, for most of us, it's just gibberish. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, I'm talking to you right now, and I don't think I have like a lot of expertise in health, for example, coverage. Um, and as a journalist, I've certainly covered some topics that I didn't necessarily have the expertise in. But at the same time, like part of why I love journalism is because it allowed me to research topics that I, I learn a lot. And then I get to talk to people who are absolute experts, uh, you know, quote, unquote, experts, I know that's become a dirty word. But you know, I, I do try to find people who really I know their stuff in these areas. Mm -hmm. And I get to really clarify these uh, things that I'm learning. And so I think that's a, an excellent, thi uh, excellent thing. But then I think a lot of times there's also, uh, you know, uh, our views are shaped by these articles that don't always use the best experts, like, you know, they use the most uh, promoted individuals, uh, the people who have particular narratives or the people who some journalists are more friendly with. And so you get, you don't necessarily get the most accurate depiction of reality. And I think that's like also what happens uh, in some cases. No, definitely. I completely agree. It's It can be a major problem at times. Um, this drives people who are interested in the issue of drugs and uh, either the harm reduction side or even more like, you know, a law enforcement intervention kind of side. 
drives all of us insanely batty because there's a, at least one local news story from somewhere in the country every day about someone who just they found something, they touched a little bit of fentanyl, and now, now they need Narcan, and they're in the ER. And it drives us crazy because fentanyl, even in the hospital setting where they're putting a patch and it's being absorbed to the skin, it takes a long time for that medicine to get through. It just, it just doesn't, it just isn't a medication that's absorbed very well, either through breathing it in or through the skin. That's fentanyl. And, but we have all these stories of, of emergency workers, police officers, and they were exposed to something, some kind of white powder was involved. And all of a sudden they're having heart palpitations and someone has to go grab the Narcan and then they don't really know how to use it. So they're using it wrong. And, uh, and then, you know, we get a crazy outrageous, uh, press release statements uh, it just drives people who know this topic just bonkers because it's like look this is very basic we we have we know scientifically medically like what fentanyl can and cannot do and uh right. in most of these stories it's like it's it's literally an impossibility yeah yeah absolutely well you know i want to talk to you about you know you've referred to this as the opioid prohibition and uh you know many people see the backlash uh, to opioids is something that's reasonable because of the overprescriptions that um, have happened by doctors, or at least that's the impression. I know I've talked to some people who have had situation where they have gotten addicted to opioids. So that is certainly something that happens. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I looked at some statistics where, you know, 2.1 million people had opioid use disorder. Now I know statistics can be misleading as well, but, um, but that, you know, even when I was talking to you earlier, you said that, you know, case can be made for both sides of this equation, you know, cause they do kill a certain number of people, but at the same time, you know, they also in some situations, you know, life can be unbearable if you don't have access to them. So I'd love to, you know, hear you kind of make a case for mm -hmm. both sides of the equation. Sure. Um, addiction with prescription opioids, um, there are many, many studies on this. They almost universally, they usually find it goes from 0.6, you know, 0.6% to 1.3% in most cases for rates of addiction. Now, for people that are pro opioids are like, look, that's really low, but you know, even at 1% and you know, there are like, you know, uh, currently we're at about 130, 140 million opioid prescriptions a year. You're still going to get quite a few people who are struggling with addiction. Now addiction is not the same as dying and overdoses. America uh, predominantly throughout our history has addiction issues. Uh, Americans, they really, whatever they're doing, they like to go all in. And then, I mean, you could, you can, you can trace this back to like Cotton Mather and their concerns about, you know, the wicked use of rum. So this isn't this isn't a new thing in that sense. But there were issues where we were, there were certain clinics that were clearly operating illegally, the so-called pill mills, while they've been overstated how widely spread they were. Um, that was an issue. That is true. Um uh, pain medicine, opioid isn't right for every medical condition. And the federal government, you know, in the 90s, this is what, this is so interesting because prior to the 90s, we actually were kind of where we're at now, where there wasn't enough prescribing. Oncologists at the time would put out studies that say, oh, you know, we 70 percent of cancer patients aren't getting their pain needs met that could. So there was a conversation going on about we need to get more people access to pain meds. And but the government, they stepped in it and what's called to as the fifth vial sign, which is like this is one of the major things you have to look if you don't take care of people's pains, you'll get in trouble. And so they over pushed on that. And so that kind of like pushed the pendulum too much in the other direction. And it played a large part in we are now. But 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 both sides have have a point. You know, there's no drug on planet Earth. There's no issue that doesn't have two sides, um, even for prescription drugs you know, that aren't addictive. It's like, look, you know, some prescriptions, they will legitimately help a person and you would give it to another person and it might kill them. And that, that's just how in life and, and medicine works. And so um, we have to we have to always be careful that we look at medicine with people as individual needs and not societal needs, because I think that's how we got into the situation we are now. 
That's interesting. It made me sort of think of the, um, you know, earlier before we started filming this, um, you know, I, I said that I, I have um, something that causes me a lot of pain. And uh, so I take uh, prescription medications and actually the medications that I take, um, you can get, uh, they're not addictive in the same way, but they are, um, there is an addictive element to them as in if you take overuse medication overuse so um after a while they can actually cause like you need to take more of them or uh there could be a, a pain factor that comes from that even so that's kind of interesting in that sense so that anything can ultimately cause issues but then if you take them away from me I will just be in pain and there's nothing, you know, I can do about that pain. I'll just suffer. Yeah. It's sad because a lot of the stuff with the opiate crisis has destroyed so much. We knew what we knew about how to deal with pain institutionally. It's just so many people have just left the field and we're losing a lot of institutional knowledge. So oh, there is an argument. The FDA just changed, uh, made a huge um, labeling change to the black box, which is their most serious warning about kind of what you're referring to, which is, um, I'm trying to think of the right term. Is it? Yeah, it's yeah, it's OIH. So it's opioid uh, you hype. No, what is it? OIH. Anyhow, I can't think. My brain is tired. But it's about <laughs> hyperalgesia. So the idea is like you take opioids for long term and it actually makes your pain worse. However, this is a concept is still very much debated. And even with medical people, it's very confusing because we have this term, then we have tolerance, which is you develop. Uh, you need more of the same drug to be able to get the same effect. And this is just opiates, yeah. this is almost all drugs. And between those two terms, also pseudo addiction, which has a terrible name for what it's trying to describe, but it's where, how do you tell when a patient, when their, their pain needs are being undermet? Well, they may show a lot of the signs of someone that is an addict, like asking for more medication, but actually they have a legitimate need. Um, and th these are very important distinctions, but they have almost entirely been obliterated right now. And so in your situation, yeah, it could be maybe you have developed some kind of issue where your pain is higher than maybe you necessarily if you didn't have that medication. Or though it could be just that you are having tolerance and you actually do need more of that medication, though. Good luck finding anyone that'd be willing to do that. Yeah, my doctor, you know, when I talked to my doctor about it, uh, she just says, well, it kind of shrugs because like, what do you do? I mean, I either don't take the yep. medication for a while and suffer through the pain, which is like makes me completely uh, I can't do anything and I'll just suffer or I just continue taking the medication and suffer the for further consequences from that. So there's not really a choice, much of a choice there. So. So I kind of, you know, I can, I can understand, even though my medication isn't stigmatized in the same way because it's not an opioid. Um, so there is that. But in terms of, um, you know, because you were cut off cold turkey in 2018. So that must have really affected your quality of life. Yes. Um, so, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit about that and what you had to do and you know how you had to sort of figure out how to balance that and, and deal with that uh, yeah and this is actually a good way to kind of describe so americans are an interesting bunch generally we're we're harder workers we're more violent we we like what we like so heavy drinkers heavy drug users They're, we're an interesting bunch um we have though a faulty idea and i think we get this from the puritans about uh, medicine and health. So the idea you probably see it from Nike, you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And maybe philosophically that's true, but medically it is not. <laughs> um, uh, people have this idea that if you're in pain, it's all this. It's like, oh, you just need to tough through it, get through the sensation and you're done. And that is just not true in any way whatsoever. I mean, this is why people die of shock. Um, this is why we need opioids for you know medical surgical interventions. Um, people who have long-term issues of not getting their pain needs met, you know, they have hot, they develop heart issues. Um, they commonly will have heart attacks, strokes. Um, if they have a uh, disease or they have some kind of comorbidity, they often develop additional ones. Um, even in the short-term situation, if you can't get your pain meet, it does pain met, it does lead to more negative outcomes. I, I'm not, I'm not totally sure how this idea became mainstream, but, uh, 
from what I can tell, maybe it was always around, but it just isn't true. You, you do need your pain needs met to a degree. Um, maybe like you have some chronic pain and you can get through life without, that's fine. But for many people like myself, who has a very significant illness that causes a lot of pain, I do need that pain control. Unfortunately, what happened was after I lost that, like I told you, I, I previously was a school teacher, that all ended because my function after I had my medicine with, withdrawn just plummeted. And it wasn't just the pain. It was now all these weird little medical things I was developing. I, you can't really tell because I, I have my camera set up. I actually have a, an eye issue where most of the time I'm in very low light because my eyes are hypersensitive to light. And this is a, because of losing that pain medication. It just causes all kinds of problems. And, you know, so many times I hear from people who, who lost their payments or their pain needs being met. They don't tell me I want my pain all taken away. What they usually say is I would just like to be able to work again. I would just like to have my life back again. You know, I, I'm not asking for everything. I just want to have some function. And that's kind of how it is for me. Um, but it's tough because if you in this current world where it is extremely difficult to find a prescriber that's willing to, to help you and stick with you, um, people like myself in the millions, they just do not have that access anymore. And that is, is and will cause a lot of uh, health issues down the line. You know, the thing with pain is that it is something that is very real, right? Um, and again, I'm somebody who's definitely experienced that pain uh, due to neurological reasons, but it can be, you know, invisible. And when it's an invisible pain, uh, it becomes like, so how can a medical practitioner, I guess, tell the difference between somebody who is looking to abuse a drug or sell it maybe on the black market or something like that, as opposed to somebody who has a real need. I mean, I think in your case, it's a lot more obvious because it's so much more documented, but it's not always the case. Um, so how can you tell the difference between that and ensure that abuse does not happen? Um, that is a big bioethics question that's being talked about right now. If I'm going to be honest, the, that narrative, in my opinion, is pretty much BS because in my experience, you know, as a reporter, I probably met with like 150 patients and their families. And very, very often the doctors do not really care what's in the records. It doesn't matter if they have specialists or they have a long history that establishes they have a pain issue. Often they gaslight them. Often they just won't engage. So it, it's so people think like, oh, I have to determine this person's really a pain patient or not. No, most of the time people are just blown off. It's like they're not they're not even going to try. It's, it's so risky for the physician and they're not, you know, maybe it's a, a mental, emotional thing. It's like I can't recognize this as happening because if I recognize this as happening and I can't do anything about it, what does that say about me as a person? Um, but this is kind of what like Dr. Lynn Webster was trying to figure out with pseudo addiction. It's like, how do you how do you figure out the legit person from the faker or the person, see, you know, who is seeking drugs through the system? And we are not mind readers, of course. It, it's, a, it's a difficult thing. It, there's not really an easy solution, usually for the physicians, even if, they're, if they are in good faith, they will check the history. Um, they will uh, now, whether they're good physicians or not, they have to check things like the PDMP score, which is basically a score given by this company that all the states now use, which tells a person, tells about what kind of risk the person is with an opioid prescription. And that's a whole, that's like a huge topic. But um, those are generally the kind of things that they look at. Do you think like um, ethically, perhaps it doesn't matter because the odds of getting it wrong kind of override? Um, like if you reject someone in error who actually needs it, that perhaps that is a worse consequence that than perhaps giving it to someone who might sell it or or might you know use it recreationally in my experience most physicians do understand that certain patients do have specific needs and they do need pain care um, the problem is this isn't an issue of recognizing if people have pain this is an issue of, of legal problems law enforcement and just cowardice in general the problem is in in our world in the U.S., 
the largest problem, even before all this facing your average American physician is getting sued. Okay. That, that is the major problem. You go to medical school. My brother is graduating from medical school next month. They have to take courses on this. This is just like one of those realities. And the problem is with law enforcement as involved as it is trying to take out doctors with this issue in the news, as much as it is, people are just so afraid to prescribe an opioid for many reasons, but also for one, like you prescribe an opioid later on, a patient comes to you and say, this person may be addicted or it hurt me somehow. Because, you know, and here are all these examples. You get them from a jury. They're often going to cite because, you know, the jury doesn't know better or they get in front of a judge. Judge often doesn't know better. And so it's just too dangerous for a physician to do this. And this is a hard thing for many people who have been abandoned by their physicians and can't get pain care because they, they develop a lot of anger, a lot of vitriol towards the people that aren't taking care of them that have taken the Hippocratic oath. But what I've, what I've seen and what I've tried to tell people is try to have a little bit of um, Christ-like charity because it, I've seen the kind of sacrifice these people make to, you know, get through medical school, get that training, go through the residency program, work your way up the ladder. You, uh, you and your family invested of thousands of thousands of hours. And it's like, as I have heard, more times than I can count, physician tells patients, look, I, I agree you have this issue. You need pain care. However, I'm not going to sacrifice my license to give it to you. So, so it is a bit of a false dynamic because there are people that actually do know better. But, but the issue isn't about knowing better or not. It's about risk. If I give this person a prescription opioid, even if there's someone I know, what are the chances it's going to hurt me down the line? So are are these cases happening often where people where doctors are being sued? Is this actually a frequent thing? Yes. Yes, yes. It is. Yeah, it's okay. a very frequent thing. Yeah. This is the problem with the FDA's new labeling change. Anytime you raise the temperature of the water on a medical issue, someone out there is going to sue some doctor. It's it's just it's you know, you can you can watch your clock by it. It's that frequent. Um, it, it's why every physician in the country has, you know, this is by law. You have to have insurance that covers lawsuits. Um, this is just a, a frequent issue. But more important than the being sued is that law enforcement themselves will cause people a lot of problems. They'll arrest you. They'll throw you in jail. The, even if they can't charge you with anything, this has happened in a number of cases. Um, there's one particular guy I like to talk about later in the, this uh, conversation, if I can. They won't be charged with anything formally, but they will have been walked through the community, you know, the per basically the perp walk. It's like everyone knows bad person walking. And that is a huge stigma that really it's it's almost impossible to erase. And so the fear about law enforcement getting involved or your medical provider or the insurance companies reporting on you, complaining about you, you know, directing problems towards you, all that stuff is so high. There's just like if you're a physician, you kind of have to put the blinders on. It's like, I just need to focus on the patients I can help and try not to get in trouble. And for someone who's like me that lost pain medicine, this does look like you're being a coward. You know better. Why aren't you doing it? But if you are a member of that person's family, if you are a physician, you're like, no, this is survival. This is what I have right. to do to keep my job. You know, I should I let my kids go hungry because I want to prescribe a few more patients? But if you're if 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 the doctor is being sued specifically by the patient, does that not indicate that perhaps that patient was unhappy, so did not feel served by that doctor? Yes and no. People are weird when it comes to lawsuits. There is some opportunism. Also, it's often lawsuits are not made directly by the people, but it's often by family members or friends. Um, it's it. The litigation problem, tort in the U.S., that's a big, complicated issue. So it's hard to say how much of that is legitimate or not. I imagine some of it that probably is. I mean, people people can have negative outcomes. Like I said, even if only 1% of people are becoming addicted, getting a prescription opioid, which is you know roughly the same rate for other substances. Uh, that doesn't mean, though, that there's people that became addicted. That wasn't a huge negative problem in their lives. That, that, was, that wasn't a harm. The problem is you have to balance between the 1% and the rare things that happen versus reality. And if you don't, then you end up in a situation where we don't let anyone have pain medicine, which is kind of where we're at right now. Yeah. So, okay. And the police are going after these doctors yep. as well in the perp walks uh, you mentioned what is their motivation for doing so because they're obviously seeing that as a not net harm in some way if they're doing that 
Yeah, so the best I can tell, the two major influences there is one, true believers are people, you know, look, you ask your average Democrat or Republican, they're more than likely to agree with most of the drug war, or at least the, the concept of trying to arrest your way out of a drug crisis. So there are a ton of people in law enforcement and true believers, but it's also it's also become getting a physician is like the new mob boss from the 90s, where like if you want to get ahead in your department, you need to get like a big arrest. And it's just a little bit easier and they're available and you can get records so you can take a physician down and they get all, you know, everyone's clapping on your back, like way to go, you're a hero, you did it. Uh, so the incentives are kind of strong for law enforcement. Uh, it is a major problem though, because at least with local law enforcement, they usually have to like sh show some kind of evidence or usually make some kind of charge. The major problem we're getting is from either state and especially federal. DA, of course, is by the way, is just like, ugh, uh, that that's a, I don't like the use of the term, but very triggering for me because they are, has been such a negative player at what's happened to people, physicians and patients. It makes it hard for me to believe that the, many of them don't actually know, like they should know better what they're doing because they have the stats, they have the records, they know what's happening because of their cons the actions of their, the consequences of their actions, they see it. And it doesn't seem to change what they do whatsoever. And I just on a moral human level cannot make heads or tails of that. So, you know, I, I'm somebody who does tend to, you know, want to find a compromises and to protect people. But also uh, I tend to say, try to find as much freedom as I can for individuals. So in looking at it through that lens, um, I guess, and, you know, and I think people do to some extent find, uh, find themselves sort of slaves to addictions. What are some ways that, you know, what role can a physician play our society can play in, in sort of protecting people I, I, in some ways from themselves, but still allowing people to have access to these medications so that their pain management can help them. So what's the relationship, I guess, the ideal relationship between a physician and a patient and, you know, monitoring them and, and ensuring that they have that process where they have the access that they need, uh, they have the choice to, to, to get that medication, but also that they have, um, you know, a process by which they can ensure that they're not getting addicted, that they're not using substances that are say tainted, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Where do you see that going in, in an ideal world? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's a good question. You know, a maybe a little bit of context will help listeners so basically like i said the history of opioid prescribing was prior to the 1990s it was very restricted then we we moved to having too much and now it's very restricted again um we actually in a rates of addiction have not drastically really increased we have the same issue we've we've always had you know we had drug problems in the 50s 60s 70s 80s 90s you know. uh, the, we, this has been studied to heck and back we don't actually see a huge higher rate of people getting addicted. But the problem is we've we've gone from substances that are relatively safe and controlled to substances that might kill you on the first try, which is, of course, illicit fentanyl in the street market supply. Um, when it comes to physicians, like what, what they can do, ideally, we would want physicians who look at patients individually and decide based on individual needs and nothing else what would be best for my patient we got into this problem because we started to dictate to doctors how they should handle the situation that is just not that's just not the ideal scenario every patient is different every patient even when it comes to medication is going to use that medication differently some people can get really sick on one medication and another person can do very well on it even when it comes to opioids and this is kind of a problem with the cdc and, and the mmes which is morphine milligram equivalents, which is kind of this term they try to use to try to put a quantitative number on opioids what what one person gets out of 10 milligrams of oxy is not the same as another person someone might get a lot of relief and another person might not get very much at all and they actually will have to get more it's very complicated so you have to keep it at the individual level. 
And, you know, this is true also with addiction medicine. And things are starting to open up some on the addiction medicine side, which is really good. But, you know, it's still difficult in many cases to get things like methadone, buprenorphine. Um, ideally, you just want it to be at the individual level. And so if a patient's saying, I'm having addiction issues, then they can work with their physician and try to figure it out. Or if they have a pain issue, they can work with the physician and figure it out. The problem is, is that we have everyone else that wants to decide what happens is going on in the uh, in the room between the physician and the patient. I think that's what led us into the trouble we are. And if it's not really something we get a handle on, if we keep thinking like, it's not just those two's, um, and maybe this cause I'm a libertarian, but, uh, it's not just those two's like decision. It's like everyone's decision. We all get to decide what you get in the, in the room. I think that leads to a lot of, a lot of problems. Yeah, I think on this particular topic, I tend to lean libertarian as well. But um, but I but I also think that this is something that um, you know because you because you indicated that the numbers sort of stayed the same, but the restrictions haven't stayed the same. It's gotten more no. restrictive. So that to me that says that actually it's gotten the problem seems to have actually gotten worse. Uh, <laughs> In some ways, right? So perhaps that happens because uh, patients can't have as open of a relationship with their doctors, so they're looking maybe elsewhere, like streets, um, right? So essentially, yep. if you could have a more open, I'm um, just working through this, but if if you could have a more open relationship with your doctor, including being able to say, "Listen, I'm I think I'm getting a little uh, addicted to this," right? If mm -hmm. you could freely have that conversation with your doctor, you can work with that doctor to make make the situation better. Maybe not go to the, to a dealer and get you know who knows what. Um, so it seems to me that you can cr control the situation better, uh, and you might see a decrease in in some of this stuff. Yeah, it's referred to as by researchers as the iron law of prohibition, that generally when you block people from whatever it is, they will find some kind of alternative. But often when you block something, you're not just taking out people who are using that whatever that thing is for illegitimate purposes. You're also getting the people who actually need to use it. And this is true, like, you know, for people who have to buy, you know, uh, materials for contracting to people who need medication. Um, we got in this mess, you know, it's really frustrating that physicians and patients have been blamed for all these deaths that they're having because we got in this mess because the Obama FDA thought this a brilliant, brilliant idea, just so smart. They decided in 2009 that they thought, you know, all, we have all these people in Appalachia and they, many of them are using, uh, Oxy, you know, that they, they bought from someone else. Um, it was someone's grandma that had some extra, or it's like a pill mill that's just kind of selling it out like candy and they were taking this so the idea was well they're they're using this easy easy to get medication if we just remove this from people then they'll just stop using <laughs> that was the idea I'm, I'm not making this up this is that's what their huge theory was and so they did this this starting in 2009 it really got enacted by 2011 and what happened was you have all these people who were who are addicted or who are using uh prescription opioids and now that this drug has been reformulated, so they can't actually use it to make, which was kind of like you know, the poor man's heroin, they just went to street drugs. But at the same time this was happening, uh, we, the drug dealers started getting the precursor chemicals from places like China and Mexico to make fentanyl, which is dirt cheap and very powerful. And so it was like this perfect storm situation. But the perfect storm wouldn't have happened if you know you didn't push people to go be out in their dinghies in the perfect storm. And that was because it was decided that if we just reformulate oxycodone, if we just make it hard for people to use these drugs to get high, then they'll just stop like magically, like poof. You know, one day they're addicts, the next day they're not. And I, I know I sound like, you know, I being sarcastic, but that was kind of the yeah, magic thing. I didn't think it would. <laughs> At first, I really thought you were praising the policy, but then I realized where you were yeah. going with it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, are there countries, um, are there any countries or jurisdictions that you think their opioid policies or their drug policies, the U.S. should look to as a, as a good model that you've seen? Uh, for this issue? Um, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the U.S. is being as influential as we are in the... Um, public health institutions, not just domestically, but internationally, 
uh, we're seeing other countries kind of follow in our wake. So the UK used to be really good, and I would actually choose that probably before th these recent years. Um, the UK has a few more over-the-counter drugs that are technically have opioids in it. They're, they're a little bit more free. Um, Germany, in many ways, is a positive. Japan is, in many ways, a positive. This is kind of like one of the easiest points to make why the opioid crisis narrative is bunk, is that we weren't the only ones that just started using opioids more in the 90s, because um, this was a problem across the planet in developed nations. One of my favorite, one of my favorite directors of all time, Juzo Otami, I, I, any of his movies, they're all great. Um, he, one of his movies is Dibionin, which is basically about this guy who has cancer and he's going through the, the end of life process. And there's this great scene in the hospital. This movie's from 1993 in Japan. And it's, it's this, just this nurse. She is so brave. And she's like, look, we can treat this guy's pain. I know how we can do it. So it's safe and he won't get addicted. And it's like this really like triumphant moment. This like this person is really putting herself out there. And you look at it from from uh, these eyes. They're like, why is that an issue? But it really was. It was it was an issue across the the world where we people are just not being prescribed enough pain medication in many cases. It's still an issue in the third world. It's still an issue in Africa. One of the biggest problems Africa faces medically is a lack of access to pain care which as I tried to say earlier, is like just as essential as antibiotics or anesthesia. It's like, um, it, you, there's so many things you just cannot do medically, surgically without pain care. And it's just such an important thing to do. But why we know that the opioid crisis narrative is bunk is these other countries don't have an addiction problem. These other countries don't have an overdose problem. We do. They don't. You are not going to find a mass overdose problem in Japan. You're not going to. So, find what does it Japan do differently? What does or Germany? They or they, open, do they, do they open. They open. Well, they. I mean, their system is widely different than ours. But when it comes to opioids, they just opened it up more. But they haven't had the wild swing back. Um, similar for Germany. There are other countries that start using more opioids, but they didn't have the have the problems that we did. So it's not just that we opened up prescribing to more people. There's something else in this equation, something about being American and our culture, society, something that makes it different here than other places. Even when you compare the what US you, to Canada. Because you said that earlier different. on. Yeah, you said something earlier on, too, that it is something different about American culture that causes this. Do, do you know what that is? Do you, can you put your finger on it? I, I, don't, I don't know if it's if it's from our, our puritanical ancestors. I mean, there are a lot of positives, but they definitely had an interesting view on medicine and health. I don't know if it's something about our rough and tumble nature. I don't know if it's because, you know, Americans are more likely in some ways to have work injuries that might lead to something where they need more pain medication, especially, you know, places in the, like industrial Ohio, the Appalachia, that was a, that's a big driver of, a, I'm not certain. There are a lot of theories as to why, but uh, which one is correct. I don't know, but I do know that there is a difference that is basically understood by the people who follow this stuff. I, you know, in Canada, it's interesting because you've gotten the MAID program now, right? The uh, euthanasia. Yep. <laughs> but you don't necessarily have free access to opioids. I don't know if it's better than the U.S. in that regard. But, uh, I mean, it's a little bit better on, the, uh, you know, uh, cannabis. And uh, it's it's yeah. legalized. And it, it's not as uh, prosecute. You know, they don't prosecute uh, a lot of drugs has been the same um, ferocious way as the U.S. does. No, no, very I few countries appreciate. do. Maybe the Philippines, maybe China. Yeah, yeah. I personally am in favor of that. Um, since it's a podcast, I think I can express my opinions. <laughs> probably. But, um, <laughs> yeah, probably. That's that's what I'm like. What makes a podcast different from my journalism work? It's like a, uh, in journalism, I can never express my views, but um, on a podcast, it's a little different. But it's um, but I but I do think it, it makes for. I, I, I personally think it's like a for a better society, but um, even though those things aren't necessarily legal, but they don't like put people in jail for this stuff. Um, but it is, but it's still not, you know, like it, it, it comes down ultimately to choice, right? And and if you, if one can choose to end their life, you know, this is like the ultimate choice. It's like, why can't one choose to have a painkiller, you know? Yep. So I guess, and I guess in the U S there's a different, 
kind of sense of like choice. It's like on the one hand, there are people who are like, okay, we should have the choice to have guns. We ha should have the choice to have abortions. I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm putting out all these different controversial things here, but like, but people seem to have wildly different views as to what choices different people should have or not have. And yeah, I find that kind of interesting. It is interesting. Our risk assessment is way off too. Even at the amount of people who are dying now from uh, drug overdoses, 70, you know, it's about 110,000 right now a year, uh, 70,000 of that, which is fentanyl based. Uh, usually actually most overdose cases is not any single drug. It's usually a, a bunch of different drugs in a cocktail. Um, but you look at what actually kills people a year, even at the high amount it is, alcohol is far more dangerous than fentanyl. 95,000 people a year die every year from, from uh, alcohol use. Only 70,000 are dying from uh, fentanyl. Uh, tobacco kills half a million people every year. <laughs> Medical errors yeah. kill 250 to 450,000 people every year. COVID killed about 400 something thousand Cancer and heart attacks are still like the, the top ones. I think cancer is like 600,000. Heart attacks is a little bit above that. I mean, it's like even, even workplace accidents, you know, it's a significant number. I, uh, it's a statistically, it's a very broad term, but for uh, unintentional injuries, it kills about 250,000 people every year. I mean, there are risks that are much worse than fentanyl, but when it comes to medicine, it just seems different. People have a different opinion or attitude about what should be appropriate or not. And they have very strong attitudes, <laughs> even if they don't really understand the subject very well. Well, a lot of it is, a lot of it seems social, even to me, like, look, before we had this conversation uh, and even before we connected, I, I did have some prejudices about this topic. I, I will admit to that just because I never really thought about it that much. And I kind of went by what I heard and I just didn't, like I said, I didn't give it that much thought. And I mostly talked to people who are affected negatively by opioids. And so it is certain things are just much more socially acceptable, right? Like, like you mentioned, drinking has massive consequences, even just, you know, even if you're not drinking yourself to death and causing yourself health consequences from, from alcohol, which has no positive, you know, uh, benefits aside from, you know, physically aside from, you know, maybe some social giddiness, mm -hmm. giddiness and social lubrication, um, you know, people get behind the wheel all the time. And, and it has negative consequences, but we widely accept that as a, as a norm um, versus other things that we don't accept and judge much more that actually might have much fewer negative consequences. This yeah. is something that I just never, you know, and, and as I was talking to you and thinking about it more, I think my, my view has sort of changed about, about it as I sort of reflected more on it. And I just don't think we have that lens as much. And I think most people, if they thought about it more, so then it becomes more a matter of like, okay, what's the greater harm? You know, do you let people suffer, not have access, or do you allow access, but then some people will be harmed by it because they will. I mean, you have to uh, accept mm -hmm. that as well uh, and acknowledge that because, as a result, I, do, I certainly think there will be a certain increase in some of the people who will be casualties to it because they'll have easier time access, accessing it. And so you're always kind of weighing the cons and, and, and pros. And, and it's it's tough. So I think ultimately becomes a little bit of a ethical, moral framework and what you believe. Um, but... Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a balancing act, but at the same time, do you want? I don't know that I want people to suffer from from pain, right? Uh, <laughs> I agree. Um, it, there is there is some truth to that. You know, it's very much a Thomas Sowell point. There are no solutions; there are only trade offs. To some degree, there will always be issues of addiction. These are powerful medications. What makes it useful for covering pain also makes it useful for recreational purposes, and that will always be true. 
Um, we've had opioids for thousands and thousands of years. We are likely to continue to have them, even if we find a new innovation that we can place them, which is unlikely, but possible. Um, opioids are still going to be part of the loop, and this is always going to be part of the, the conversation. This is this is true of all kinds of medications, even ones you don't typically think of being addictive. You know, there are all kinds of conversations about insulin abuse, or we're now going through the stuff with Ozempic. Those are those are important conversations to have. What people need to understand, though, is addiction and what kills people is vastly different. And while some people do become addicted through um, first time exposure to pain pills. Most people who are becoming addicted prior had some kind of addiction issue prior to that. Usually people who start becoming addicted to even pain pills, it's not theirs. It's like for someone else, like for grandma. Um, and what is killing people is not pain pills almost at all. It is almost exclusively illicit fentanyl, black market fentanyl in some kind of street drug where it shouldn't be. And people usually don't know what's even in it. And that's what's killing them because it doesn't take very much fentanyl to kill someone. And of course, if you're an opioid naive person, you know, maybe you're just used to taking Coke and you, you have this huge hit of a gigantically powerful opioid, it can knock you dead. Um, it's, but people are kind of misinformed, but you are correct. It's just, at some level, there will always be this trade-off there. There is no perfect world and we kind of have to try to learn to live with it. And, you know, the, I'll give the harm reduction people some, some credit here. They are right in the understanding is we'll just have to accept some of this and we'll just have, try to have to mitigate the potential harms that come from it. Have you seen, by the way, the Matthew McConaughey film? Uh, uh, what is it called? I'm trying to remember the name, but it was about uh, he was dying from AIDS, I believe. And he was trying to get pills from Mexico. And it was it was a similar argument in a way because he couldn't get the same medications in the U.S., but he was... Uh, you don't know the, <laughs> the movie. I I, think I I have heard this because I my mom loves Matthew McConaughey. There's probably not something he's done that she hasn't seen. I don't know. I think it's the accent. But um, <laughs> I, I have, I've heard of this movie existing, but have I seen it? No. <laughs> yeah. Now, it was a good example and way of kind of bringing that conversation, I think, in the mainstream, too, because it was, it, it again, it kind of brings it to that argument, I think, of like, um, personal domain and personal choice um, of of being able to access things that improve his life. I mean, he was dying and he had, you know, yep. he didn't have access to certain things. And so he was like importing them. <laughs> but no, this was and this is actually true of the AIDS crisis in the 80s, where when that era when it was hard to get pain medicine, especially when you had something as stigmatized as HIV or AIDS, it was very difficult to get a good health care in general, but especially pain care. That's that is very well documented. That is very true. Um, I, what was I, I, when you said that I had a point, I'm trying to think in my head what I was going to say. Sorry. Um, you know, yeah. Uh, where was I? Um, well, I, you we'll know what? I lost it. It's gone. I don't know what it was. It the, happens. The, the gerbils that run the, the hamster wheels in my brain, they're a little tired. So. I can understand that. Uh, I I will often, sometimes it, it happens to me when I'm writing. And uh, I mean, that's how I write most of my articles. Like I'll, I'll just start putting in words and eventually it comes to something and it's like, great. This oh, is why okay. Ch Chad GBT can't do what I want to do. <laughs> okay. Okay. I just remember the journalists, they caught up, they made it. They, they, they got one of them off lunch break and they got the wheel going. I was so, rooting uh, for them. <laughs> Um, so as many people, though, that deal deal with addiction, um, there are many more people who actually need opioids. Um, the numbers actually the people actually need to use uh, pain care is actually very high. And we're not even talking about surgical. We're just talking about. So if you're just talking about chronic pain, people who are on opioids all the time, there's about eight million of them, though. There are th about 30 million Americans who need opioids for chronic pain in some kind of case in that year. Um, in any year, about a third of Americans have some kind of opioid prescription, whether it's for like in their wisdom teeth removed or they had an accident or a surgery. Um, it's a lot of people, you know, 100 million Americans in this country, about one third have set some level, whether it's significant or small, chronic pain. It's a lot. It's a lot of people. And, you know, it's not like 
not treating chronic pain doesn't actually come with an economic or financial cost to the society. Uh, economists have looked at this several times. The general numbers they find is that it's estimated between about 500 to $600 billion per year are wasted on missed work days and medical expenses due to poorly treated chronic pain. It, it, it is a significant issue. And while the, the addiction issue is very important, if we're talking about numbers and the people impacted, actually the people that need access to this medication is more. But but this conversation is just so loaded and people have such little information and access to um, context that people don't really understand that. They, they think they really do think the crime of the century, which is a horrible HBO documentary, they really do take that narrative as being like how it is. Um, I don't blame people for seeing it. That is people can only act on what information they get, but it's bad information. Well, and also people and their lives, right? Like some people die from overdoses, but some people die because they end their lives because of the pain. Yes. In, intolerable. Yes. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major, I'm sorry to interject. It is a very emotionally difficult topic for me. I used to be more of an advocate on the side, basically. So I guess the other um, activist movements advocate means something different. But in the chronic pain movement, advocate is less about putting yourself out there publicly, though there is that. It's more about helping people when they're in a situation that they need help. So often chronic pain advocate, like um, I used to do this more myself, you know, when I would do a story, some people always come out and say, hey, I lost my doctor. I'm in a desperate situation. Can you help? And I'll try usually to refer them to someone that might know able to help. But just generally, a chronic pain advocate will work with someone and like if they lose a doctor, they'll try to help them find another. Or if they can't get access to a good treatment, they'll try to think up alternatives. If they're worried about the person that they've been suicidal, they'll contact law enforcement, do mental health checks. I don't do that anymore, though, besides like referring people on to someone that might help because it was just too emotionally draining because the number of people in the chronic pain community that turn to suicide is very high. And on the, even in the social media communities like Facebook, Reddit, if you were to say, actually, I'm not okay with a person killing themselves because they have chronic pain, that's an unpopular statement to take because people are so depressed and so charged on this issue. So the suicide issue is, is huge. It's, it's very depressing. It's overwhelming. Um, I had a friend uh, last year, someone that I had worked with previously, uh, and I, I, wrote, I almost want to like go deep into the story, but it's your show, so I'll leave you to it. But you know, he was an active member of the community. He was loved. He had been on all kinds of um, outlets that covered him, including Vice. Wonderful guy, Danny Elliott and his wife Gretchen. And last year in November, he one day DA comes in, snaps up his doctor. They, they arrest him. They don't really charge him with anything. They let him go, but they still suspend his license. And he had 240 pain patients. These are people with very complex, difficult illnesses. Many of them will not survive without pain care. Now, did the DEA do anything about it? No. Did the CDC, which had, technically has a task force that's supposed to help do anything about it? No. Did the community, you know, general community in any way, like, hey, these, we have patients, the doctors, they do anything? No, no one did anything except chronic pain patients are trying to help them. So eight days later, um, the brother of Danny uh, hadn't heard for his brother in a while. He called the cops, had them come check, and they found Danny and his wife, Gretchen, dead. They committed suicide. Um, and the explanation is pretty clear that this is a vice did report. They shared some of the suicide note. And this is I have heard this more times than I can count. Uh, there's not a day of the year that I do not get a message like this. And this you'll hear this all the time. I'm just going to read this one little bit from it. Uh, here's what Danny wrote. I just can't live with the severe pain anymore. And I don't have any options left, he wrote. There are millions of chronic pain patients suffering just like me because of the DEA. Nobody cares. I haven't lived without some sort of pain and pain relief meds since 1998. And I considered suicide back then. My wife has called 17 doctors this past week looking for some kind of help. The only doctor who agreed to see me refused to help in any way. So what am I supposed to do? And that is a story I have heard, I don't even know how many times. And, and it's led to all kinds of, of terrible decisions. It's a major problem right now in the community. We have a lot of people, especially in Canada, who are taking advantage of using MAID. Um, people just feel like society doesn't care anymore. And every step people make towards more medical freedom, it gets curtailed in some way, or it doesn't really seem to make much of an impact. 
And so we have an issue right now. So many people who have a, a disability or dealing with bad chronic pain that they, you know what? They said, it's nothing's going to change. I might as well click game over. And it's hard to argue against that. I do argue against it strongly. I don't, I'm very much against suicide, especially if it's for, uh, you know, a disability, but it's difficult to make that when people feel like no one cares. And it's hard to say that they're wrong because after this happened to this date, his doctor, Dr. Brockhoff does not have his license back after this terrible thing happened. And it was national headlines. A, a bunch of very professional top nonprofit people came and started helping. They had lawyers involved with these patients. Uh, there were about a dozen of them that were trying to talk to the, the fifth circuit to overturn this. And eventually we did, they did get a response from the DOJ, the department of justice lead attorney. Uh, I'm not going to, I don't want to get her in trouble. So I won't say her name, but she's very influential. And when, when they wanted to say, Hey, can you please, you know, you, he was never charged with anything. Can you just let him have his license back? Here's what she said about the people that were asking for, uh, intervention to let Brokoff prescribe again, quote, petitioners have had since October 25th, 2022 to find a new physician and their unwillingness to do so does not warrant intervention, unquote. Now, when you get statements like that for people who feel like their world has collapsed and they're dying, it's like you cannot see past the horizon. You cannot imagine that there will be eventually a sunrise. And I, it is a constant fight for people that cover this and who are interested in this topic to try to find an answer to that. And I wish there was a better one, but at the moment until we either have a new innovation or we get law enforcement and this kind of fear culture to back off, we will continue to be in this situation where people are losing pain meds and they're people that need it. And no one is really going to listen to them. Their community won't listen. Their physicians won't listen. Law enforcement won't listen. And, you know, people who only casually know about will assume they're an addict and they're just dead wrong. But that's kind of where we're at right now. And it's like this gigantic black pill that swallows all. And it's such a major problem right now. It, it, it really makes me depressed sometimes when I cover this because it's like, I don't know. You can only get so many people who write you saying they have suicide plans or their their mom who is you know, terminal cancer can't get pay meds because the physician tells them, I just don't want to get her addicted. <laughs> She's going to be like dead in a week. <laughs> like, who cares? Yeah. But this happens. This happens very frequently. And it's it's just so, you know, take off my reporter hat as a put on my person hat. It's overwhelming. Do you feel like, because because even in this conversation, I feel you're obviously very passionate about it and you are an activist in this arena, but at the same time, I feel like there's a, a certain detachment that is happening. Is it because you feel like that is necessary to deal with it or it will be too overwhelming? I think on some level, yes. It's also because I'm I'm a huge proponent of journalistic ethics and values. I really do believe in that, that important institution. I believe you do have to have separation. Look, you need to say when you don't have the information, we don't have the information. You say when you're wrong, you're wrong. Uh, you know, that is so important. And so while in some ways, yeah, I guess you could call me an activist. If I have to choose between the two, I'm always going to side with the truth. Because I feel like part of the reason we got in this situation is we got away from the truth. And now we're trying to like, you know, swing the pendulum in the other way. And it's just knocking over a lot of people as it makes the yeah. swing. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I think even with like the stuff that I do now, because in the, in the journalism side of things, I mean, for, for me, it was always like no opinion. If you look at my Twitter two years ago, I never expressed opinions like on, on anything. Um, even there. Um, now I like, you know, my Substack and things like that, I express opinions and I don't want people to see those as news articles or anything like that. And sometimes people will, and I'm like, no, 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 that's not, don't go to that for yeah. information. You know, those are opinions. Now I try to make those informed, you know, they're not, I still try to go for the truth and be nuanced and explore, but there is bias in them. There is opinion in them. And I, it's not activism, but there is there is a perspective in there that's not in my, you know, normal journalism. Yeah, but, um, I, I agree yeah. completely. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's important for people to know. And I think that's fine. There's there's a room for that. There's place for that, but it has to be transparent. Um, but when, yeah, and and I think something that you mentioned too with with made like some people are choosing that, and I wonder. 
um, this because you know I have mixed feelings on it. I've written about Maid uh, a little bit. Um, I'm not opposed to Maid as a whole, uh, as as an opinion, but at the same time, I see the dangers of Maid as as a system. And what I wonder, I guess, from from what you've heard, is like, is there a pressure for for people to sort of choose that as an option as opposed yes. to that it's just their free choice okay shoot i wish i kept i put this together in my notes okay so there was a big mm -hmm. story at the start of the year um this big fashion company they made this ad with made for this lady and they were like like they really like yeah, yeah you probably saw it was like really to, yeah yeah and they're like this is amazing it's so beautiful and, and the people are like, this woman, she's a poster child, you know, for this wonderful thing. And it turns out she's a chronic pain patient. And that actually she had been cut off and she wasn't being allowed benefits because right now that's what Canada's trying to do to deal with their, I mean, everyone right now in the world that has a low population rate um, is struggling to figure out a way to solve their welfare states, but they had cut her off. And she, she said, look, you know, this is, isn't really what I want to do. But what are my other options? Um, and that that speaks to me because I think that is that is the scary thing about you know that's why I say I'm against suicide because I like the slippery slope is so slippery. <laughs> and with disabled mm -hmm. people historically, it's like there might be a healthy person behind them that's gonna like give them a give them a little push. Uh, and uh, that's why I always worry about those kind of things. So it's like as a libertarian theorem, like yeah, let people choose what they want to choose. But I'm like, Ooh, it doesn't always yeah, play out very well for people like me. <laughs> That's my worry too, because um, I do have that mindset. Because some stories, and I, I looked into some some of the other stories, like even depression, right? And people automatically, oh, depression, that should never be a choice, right? But um, one of the cases that I looked at as somebody who had chosen made was this, you know, he was 80 years old, had tried pretty much everything in the book, it wouldn't go, you know, and was living in suffering, right? And there are some situations where that suffering is just by the technology that we have is not, you know, there's nothing can be done. And that suffering, I think, is up to that individual to choose what they want to do. And if it's prolonged, uh, nobody's pushing you, I think an argument can be made for that. But what worries me is that you have the situation that you did just describe where, you know, somebody is being cut off from support, where there is some encouragement, where is this glare, the video that was made by Simons was uh, maybe even had well intentioned, you know, to some extent, but it, but I don't think was a healthy thing because it was kind of glamorizing and, uh, you know, this, this kind of noble death, I don't know what, whatever you want to describe it as. Um, that to me is the danger of that. So even though I, I was ultimately somebody who supported that, uh, the idea of, of being able to choose that um, in some cases, I do think that the infrastructure of it is, is rather dangerous. And especially in situations where somebody is living with chronic pain, doesn't have access to tools or those tools are being taken away, especially in Canada where it's like uh, socialized healthcare, which even though I support socialized have healthcare, even though I would like to see better implementation of that, um, it's it's like there's more incentivization too for something like that, right? You're, you're saving money. I mean, there's been some analysis on that as well. Yep. Um, so, so there's a lot of danger in that. And that's why I've been more critical of of made in practice. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's a major problem right now. I know a few people from Canada, I've been working with um, one guy um, where that's the situation where we're like, we're not going to cover you. You have some kind of rare disease or heart situation. We're not going to cover it. But then the next breath, the physician or social work, like, but did you know made is free? We'll cover it for free. And <laughs> it's like the, that's Futurama. insane. It is. It's yeah. insane. But it, it's, it's uh, fairly well documented that there's a wonderful, I'm trying to remember this guy. He had, he was a quad, which means he had, um, he didn't have function as um, arms or legs. Um, and he had a pretty significant illness. I'm trying to think of what it was. It was one of the neuro, uh, neuro uh, degenerate disorders. Anyhow, he, he, he was this basically, he's still in this fight with this hospital where they don't want to cover what he needs, but he won't leave the hospital. <laughs> and he had got it on tape where this happened, where the doctor saying, you know, we've talked to you about this before. We are not going to cover this. 
you know, ay, 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 you know, if you want to, you know, the, the, they are willing to cover this, this thing, you know, the M-A-I-D for free. And you got the recording and you can go up and go Google it for yourself if you want. You can take a listen. This is something that's happening. It, it's I unfortunate. need that recording. Yeah. Yeah. That is unfortunate. I mean, that is, that is insane that that's happening. And that's what I was worried about because I know some people who feel differently about it. I, I've talked to someone whose uh, husband had chosen that and they had a different experience and, you know, weren't necessarily pressured into it. And that is the choice they made. And that's fine. That's a different situation. But then you hear stories like that. And that I think is, is completely unacceptable. And that is what really worries me because I just, and, and that's going to disproportionately, I think, affect people who do live in, with certain conditions and they're vulnerable. I mean, I, I mean, somebody who's either they're suffering from depression or pain. I mean, you are more likely to be pushed into something like that because you're suffering. And if you're then told, well, we're not going to cover your treatments or your pain medication, but here's this option. Mm -hmm. You might feel like that is your only option. And especially if you're like not able to work, so you can't afford any other treatment. What choice do you have? You, you're going to what live with pain for the rest of your life and suffering. Uh, not everyone is able to do that or feels like that's worth it. Mm -hmm. And then you have a governmental system that's incentivized to, to promote that. I, I think that is, that is not what that should be for sure. That is my, um, you know, biased opinion, of course. <laughs> no, I, I agree. It's different when it's like people making choices and it's different when it's systems. I think the problems come when systems just make yeah. decisions on these broadly. I don't, if, if a person makes that decision, it's like on the face of it, it's hard to make suicide illegal. Cause it's like, what are you going to do to them? Um, yeah. Uh, there's not really any kind of punishment that'd be effective. Um, but you do worry about systems causing problems. You have so much of the opioid issue. This is, I, I alluded to it earlier, but we, the, the chronic pain community in many ways has been very effective in game reforms. We've had a lot of state laws passed last year. The Supreme court sided with us. Yeah. Which was great. Thank you. Supreme court. Um, it was unanimous, which was awesome when that happens, but it has made almost very little difference. The problem is that there has been between the, what really kind of pushed prohibition along was the CDC guidelines and those were codified. And it's like, you can get as many laws as you pass as you want, but if law enforcement is going to back off of people, if we no longer, if we have insurance that they're going to continue to pay uh, physicians and surgeons more for not using opioids. If we have all these incentives and systems that say don't use it, well, it doesn't really matter what reforms we can make because you have all these other things that are happening to it. And so in that sense, I, I can kind of understand it where they're saying with, with made where it started with some rail guards, it's like, yeah, there are rail guards, but what are the incentives to push people over it? Um, and that, that's always a concern when it comes to these big health issues. Right. Well, we started out talking a little bit about your uh, journalism and, um, and and sort of your role in covering this as a journalist. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious, like what what role do you think the media can play in 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 helping with cover covering this? And, you know, how can they do this better? For one, do their gosh darn homework. Like, like seriously, <laughs> like do a little more than a 30 second Google search for crying out loud. Some of these experts they bring on, it's, it's just like, what? why would you, it's just, it's just, it's so frustrating on like, just on a like factual level. You're like, uh, come on, come on, just do the, just do a little bit of homework, please. Besides that, I think they just kind of need to have a, a more open mind. In the last year we've had seen a bigger change. I, I worked with us today today on a, a pretty decent piece that did well and that was a nice change i'm seeing more mainstream media actually cover this topic from from the other side and that's a nice change um but reporters could do better i just don't think they have experience to this issue necessarily so they don't they don't really either they don't know exists or they don't really know how to cover it um it, it's it's difficult because you know so much when you're a reporter especially when you're like like a tv you know, like you're a local reporter, it's really about who you can get access to. And because people who are being affected by this are disabled, they're a little bit harder to get a hold of. It's like you can call up the expert, you know, Dr. Andrew Kalani, who's often, often uh, frequently chosen um, 
and not not a good person. He's easy to get a hold of, but it's hard to get a hold of the patient that's been you know taken off their meds by their doctor. Um, so there are some logistical concerns. But I would say if the media would just please do their homework, try to balance the stories, maybe ask why people were given these medications like like don't just assume that they were given medications like wrong like this person got addicted so of course the for giving them a prescription must have been wrong well actually maybe there was something seriously wrong and it is a more complex story any of that would vastly improve the situation even just like asking the other side even it's like a straw man you know just getting a straw man response that would be a positive improvement in my, in my eyes because sometimes this stuff is so dreadful especially on the on the local level it's like any any improvement whatsoever very welcome please and you know they can talk to chat gpt always <laughs> yes ask chat chat gpt they'll the chat gpt will tell them it'll, it'll make up a source for them too stats too if they really want that's right yeah that's what i did no, I'm kidding. <laughs> well not not really kidding i i do you know i i i don't love everything about chat gbt but it it can it could be a good brainstorming um uh, device for, for or tool for for some things and um uh, for straw manning for sure it's a great straw man de manning device Definitely. I think also aside from um, media, I think also t TV, I mean, a type of media, but I find that there is like a very particular narrative at all times in, in the portrayal of this stuff, right? Like anytime somebody uses an opiate, it's always like, yeah. oh, there's this addiction story that happens. It's never, it's never the other way. It, it will drive you insane. If you know anything about this issue and then you watch popular media about it, they are universally or almost i guess except for the matthew mcconaughey film which you referred to they're almost universally <laughs> in that like drug warrior kind of narrative and it's frustrating because especially if it's one thing it's a movie a lot of these documentaries are really bad and they're actually pretty easy to poke holes through but they that so many of these people they just take whatever is being sold wholesale and it's like i don't blame people that have bad information or bad impression on this issue because like we can only act on the information we have and this is the information they have um but i don't know how you change it except that pe more people cover it uh have you seen the medical show amsterdam my sister loves this yeah show. i have Amst i have their amsterdam i will give them credit this and i've never seen anyone do this before or since but amsterdam put out an episode during COVID that was like it was very much anti-opioid like very anti-patient and they got a lot of people complaining for feedback and for whatever reason they actually got through to the writers so amsterdam turned around and they did an episode on the other side of the issue and it's wonderful and it wasn't like they say that opioids should always be right like they say like sometimes you know there are addictions just maybe it's not appropriate but we should also like stand up for patients understand you know people have individual needs you know these very important basic things and it was so awesome because it was like wow this is so refreshing they're being honest they recognize they got something wrong and they're handling it better i would love to see more of that but maybe that was just a one-off thing um, no they've explored some interesting issues weirdly enough in that show from sort of med medical ethical point of view i mean they had one episode i kind of wrote about where they had a patient who wanted to cut his own arm off and i mm -hmm. thought that was an interesting uh, ethical dilemma um that had some parallels and other things um i thought they they, they always explore things from sort of um the rights of a of a patient versus the doctor and 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 often there's disagreements like some doctors they think they know better versus the rights of the patient and i thought they do treat that with a lot more nuance that you would expect a show like that so i actually do appreciate some of the writing on that um which is often surprising because it might go against sort of the narratives, um, I think, at times of of what you know the mainstream point of view is on certain subjects. Yeah, I know, um, definitely so, credit to them. Yeah, so it's interesting. And the movie, the Matthew McConaughey movie, is Dallas Buyers Club. It was bugging me, so I had to look it up. <laughs> okay, yes, yeah. I have heard of Dallas Buyers Club. Yes, I do know. Yeah. <laughs> I do know what that is. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not I thought so that was a good movie. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, is is there anything that I've forgotten to ask you about or should have asked you about? You know, it's like a cheating kind of question, but uh, but I think we covered quite a bit of ground. But yeah, I, yeah and I appreciate something. 
I appreciate you taking the time to meet with me. When you talk about forbidden conversation, this that's a very apt description for what the situation is. Where and it's it's an amazing thing because you will have a person without much exposure to this, and they'll automatically assume, yeah, we should, people are getting addicted. We shouldn't be having these dangerous addictive drugs out there. But then it'll happen to them, and all of a sudden it changes. It's kind of like what happens with free speech. <laughs> you see this on Twitter yeah. a lot, where like. Like they're like, I, they don't see the value in free speech, but then all of a sudden they're censored like, holy cow, now I'm a, I'm a free speech advocate. Uh, this should never happen, uh, which is kind of nice. It was just, so this, it goes, the question though, it's like, how long will this go on for? How long until medicine gets out of this fad? Medicine across the world, but especially the US goes through fads and cycles. You can see this from nutrition medicine, from what's in vogue and what's not, you know, margarines, sodium, yes or no, carbs, yes or no, et cetera. It's just, this is just how medicine is. Uh, so how long till we swing out of this? Um, my, the one I agree with, and this is reported by Jacob Salm. He's a excellent, excellent drug reporter. who writes for Reason currently. And basically what he has predicted is about 20 years from where this started. So probably could say 26, 2017. So maybe 2036 37 which is 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 really depressing because i don't know if people who have significant pain issues are going to live that long but i do believe one day we will get out of this like like i do uh, reporting all kinds of things important things and stupid things i love games culture entertainment i get myself in trouble sometimes running on those um <laughs> and while the while I like that stuff, I I'm not going to say it's important. But I know from a gut, you know, I'm a, I'm a I'm a religious person to some degree, and I know you know the reason I was put on this earth besides to help uh, raise my siblings, take care of my family, you know, um, all those important life things. As a reporter, this is it, and I know in the, my heart of hearts that in time, I don't know how long it is, but one day society will recognize they made a tremendous mistake. And I don't know if anyone will be held responsible. Probably not. But there will come a time where people recognize the evil that has happened. And that they, hopefully they will learn from it and they will not repeat this mistake. And I, I do believe that sincerely because people say, no, no one cares what happens to me. That's not true. And, and I would tell anyone that's listening to this that's on the fence, either they or their loved one have lost pain access or struggling. Just don't, don't give in to those dark impulses. Don't, don't give in to that temptation. You know, even if you have to try to live just to, you know, to all these people who want to ruin your life just to prove them wrong, I think that's a reason enough to keep going. No one should be ending their life. No one should be giving up on their life because they're struggling with a disability. Whatever, no matter how hard that disability is or difficult or painful, life is an incredible blessing. And while it may take us a long time to get out of this, I believe one day things will be made right. The records will be had. And, uh, we just have to try to get through this as best we can, which is why I love how the chronic pain community focuses so much on trying to take care of each other. It's it's actually kind of a beautiful thing um, to watch all these people, you know, whether they're professionals, like some top doctors I know. Um, Dr. Uh, Stefan Kurset is one of my favorite people in the universe. Incredible researcher, very, very important guy. And he just spends lots and lots of time. He doesn't tell anyone. He doesn't get paid. He just like if someone asks for help, he'll try to help them. And that kind of stuff is amazing. It's amazing. So even in all this chaos and all this negativity, there is a beauty to it, to how people respond. And I think once we get through this, more of that will be shown. We just need to tell people, please hold on. Keep making these arguments. Keep taking care of each other. If you lose uh, access to your doctor, try to get help. Try to seek out alternatives. Do what you can because life is so precious. It is so so precious and important and wonderful and it just makes me sad that there are people who decide that life is no longer for them just because they weren't allowed to get pain medicine uh, that shouldn't be the case but in many cases it is but that won't always be the case and i know that but to the deepest part of my myself i know that that will change so for me personally i'm just like whatever function i can get I'll try to live with it. Whatever work I can get done, I'll try to live with it, but I'm going to hold on. I'm going to see my uh, uh, niece and nephew who are very special to me. And I'm looking forward to seeing them graduate high school and having families of their own and all those amazing things. And it's that, that won't happen if I don't stick it in. So, you know, I have to ask myself these questions too. 
but things will get better. Things will get better. Don't don't always just swallow the black pills. I know that was a bit of a mess, but the lack of hope on this issue is just so strong and prevalent, and it just swallows so many people up. And I fear sometimes, like when I talk about this issue or reporting it, there are people that get lost kind of in the swamp. But no matter how dark things get, I know things will get better in time because people, I still believe, despite their flaws, are fundamentally good. And I've seen over and over again when someone they love or know loses pain access, their minds change quite radically on this issue. So really, it's just a matter of time. But for people like me, for people like my friend who passed away, Danny Elliott, it's just you have to try to stick it out. I don't know how, but you have to try. No, I, I think that's actually beautifully said and really resonates and reminds me of this moment that I kind of cling to a little bit is um, I was going through um, a really like physically painful moment and um, and I was still in massive pain. The medication wasn't working and I went downstairs and I thought I'd get breakfast and I couldn't eat. It was just, I couldn't swallow anything, but um, and it seems like the wor like the worst idea, but there was a piano player and, you know, sound is usually not the best thing, but he was playing so beautifully. And I found such beauty in the piano playing in that moment. And even though I had the pain, I still found the enjoyment and the beauty in that moment in that piano music that it kind of made it work that moment worth experiencing despite the pain and it's kind of stayed with me as a as a little reminder of like even when it gets really you know painful that there is still that beauty and that magic and you can find it at little moments and i think that's something important to remember and i think sometimes people miss that so I think beautifully said and very much enjoyed the conversation and I really appreciate your time and, uh, and your perspective. No, I, I'm so grateful that you, um, I, I, I feel like I kind of pushed myself on your show, but I'm grateful you let me come on and talk about this issue. Um, you know, life's complicated stuff happens, but I, I do think that the, this, this will swing eventually to a positive point. I just, just don't know how long that will be uh, but hopefully it's sooner rather than later um yeah i hope so too <laughs> and uh and i think uh i think it's uh, i think that was an important conversation to have so i really appreciate having it with you and i think you're a good um advocate for it or not an advocate maybe i shouldn't have used that word but rather a, a good uh context giver for this issue I like that. Yeah, that's good. I'll, I'll use that one. Yeah. Context giver. I think, I think you know why <laughs> I said that. Thanks again. Appreciate having you on. And, um, and I guess how can people find you? Yeah. So, uh, my Twitter, which are probably a lot of people with pain issues spend way too much time on social media. Um, <laughs> my Twitter is at happy warrior P and I cover all kinds of interesting stuff. That I find interesting, maybe not necessarily other people. Um, I'm a freelance journalist, so you can kind of you can find my articles here, there, and everywhere. Um, on health stuff, I try to focus more on trying to get a mainstream outlets with myriad success, but I do try to keep a uh, voice open. And you know, if someone wants to talk about these issues, I I try to retweet them, share them, and keep people aware of them. So you can find me here and there. Um, if you want to talk, you know, if you want, if there's some people you really want to read or learn more about this issue. Um, some of the top people I think are really good at covering this. Zachary Sigal, who's an independent journalist, kind of like myself. Um, uh, Sally Sattel, uh, if you're, he, she's more on the right side of things, right wing side of things. She's very excellent. Um, there are lots of uh, reporters out there who are trying very hard to do a good job on this kind of work in obscurity. So they exist. Uh, and I would say there are people like yourself, people who, who really do believe in, in trying to follow what is right and good and, and covering it. And I would encourage people that if you find someone like that, like Catherine Brodsky, that you follow them and you stick to them like glue, because those type of people are very rare these days and they are worth their weight in gold. Oh, thank you. Um, because I paid you in gold to say that clearly. <laughs> 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 thank you so much. And, uh, um, 
looking forward to more conversations. Excellent. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you.